Okay, I think we might get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Anita McGuire here. I'm the Vice President for Research and Innovation in University College Cork. And I'm delighted really to have the opportunity today to discuss, to chair this session, the session organised by the Irish Research Council and the UCD Geary Institute for Public Policy. And really the focus of the discussion today is really on the role of experts in the policy context. And in particular, we're looking at the continuing, the ongoing role of the research community Community in Ireland in the current uh, crisis. So the focus of this of this session is very much on the perspectives from the social sciences and how that contributes to the crisis response in Ireland relating to COVID-19. We've got three excellent panelists, each of whom are going to share their, their insights onto these, uh, onto these issues with us today. So first of all, we'll have Professor Anthony Staines from DCU, who's going to talk to us about his ongoing citizen science project and the involvement of the public in research, as well as insights into the public response to the isolation measures that we're all living with. And then we have Professor Maria Bagramanian from UCD, and she's going to talk about some of the challenges that COVID-19 poses for the traditional conceptions of the role of experts in policy decisions and the normative consequences of these challenges. And then Alan Barrett, from the director of the, ER, of the ERSI, is going to talk to us um, is going to talk to us about the challenges which arise when looking to poly policymakers and researchers to work together. While we're all in favor of evidence-informed policy, the different cultures which policymakers and researchers inhabit can make collaboration difficult. More than ever, we need to work together so these difficulties must be overcome. So I'm certainly looking forward to the contributions from each of the panelists. I'd encourage everybody who's watching to send in questions and we'll pull those together for a question and answer session after the, after the presentations today. But I think it's fair to say if you'd, if you'd said a year ago that we would be here today in the context we're working in. I don't think any of us would have anticipated it. The way in which we're working has changed dramatically in an unanticipated way. So input from the speakers today on their thoughts on this and how as a country we best negotiate our way through this to recovery it will be really very welcome. I'd encourage everybody who's on the call to mute their microphone other than the speaker so that we have the best possible sound quality. So handing over to Anthony Staines who's going to start the discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, unlike some of my colleagues, I don't have any slides, so I'm going to show you some material and I'm going to talk, but I have been occupied doing things that are actually very relevant to the subject we're talking about. So how do you go from knowledge slide which is is from the um, press briefing in the, earlier this week and it is uh, this will be very familiar to you Alan I think you're a member of this group the this is data on testing admissions to ICU deaths and so on and maybe start with this and this looks very definite you know there's 10,000, it's a logarithmic scale, so it's a little difficult to read, but let's say for the sake of argument, there's exactly 11,000 cases and it all looks very definite. And there's maybe uh, 18,000 or something admissions to hospital. There's under 1,000 deaths and there's significantly fewer admissions to intensive care. And that all looks very clear cut and very obvious and very interpretable. And none of those things are true. It's not clear cut, it's not obvious, it's not interpretable. The problem is when you show something like that to the media, to the public, to policymakers, they don't get that. They look at this and they think, ooh, that's nice, that's us sorted then. And if we look at the next slide, which is the growth rate, uh, you'll see it starts out with a very alarming growth rate of 35 to 40% over. I think, yes, over a five-day period. And this is when we had 
one case, two cases, five cases. So the, the very early stage of the epidemic. And pretty much every epidemic behaves like this. Epidemics, or almost anything you care to look at, grow this way. And now we have what looks like a very satisfactory decline of the growth rate, and then an extended period of flattening. And depending on how convinced you were or not, you could say that it's falling again most recently. And that's, more, that's very positive because the alternative, which is a growth rate that goes like that, is where you get half a million cases by about here. And the health service collapses about there and is rioting in the streets about here. So that shows that something has happened, something has been done. It's not a, in any way a useless graph. This is the same thing with, taste, with, with tests that were delayed, pushed back. And we don't know how they were pushed back or on what basis they were pushed back. But in fact, a significant number of the new cases here relate to old tests. So the, this suggests the growth rate of cases has actually dipped and has then risen again, which is much harder to make sense out of epidemiologically. But this, all of this material has to feed into non epidemiological not a theoretical consideration of modeling, but a very practical, hard question. Are we going to close the Irish economy? To which the answer was yes. And very crucially, when are we going to reopen it? So that's a very, there's a very clear and evident link here between the data and the policy. The data shows a potential catastrophe. The policy responds to it. The data is now showing that the catastrophe may be leveling out, though in fact the most recent data suggests the number of ICU beds has gone up slightly. And you can produce models like this. And these models are absolutely beautiful and very gorgeous and very pretty to look at and make a swathe of assumptions, many of which are not testable or true. One thing to which I draw your attention, which I think many policymakers are concerned about, is that the upward curve is very steep and the downward curve is equally steep. And that is imposed on the data by the model, not the other way around. So that feature, that symmetry, is not a feature of the universe. It's a feature of the model we use for the universe. So every statistician's favorite saying about models is George Box's famous remark that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And this, these are an example. These models are useful, but they're also wrong. And we have to emphasize to people why they're wrong and how they're wrong and where they're wrong. Because we understand as, mod as the community of modelers, as a community of infectious disease specialists, as a community of epidemiologists, we understand what lies behind these models. These are what are called compartment models. The pieces of the model are linked together by differential equations. You solve a system of differential equations. These curves that you see here are the end result. And we understand the process of abstraction with the necessary imprecision that goes in there. We understand this is the Irish data. This is what happens on various reproductive parameters. So this is a reproductive parameter 2.4, which is very high. And you can't see the top of that scale because it's probably at 20 or 30,000. But the number of cases goes off to infinity and beyond. This is a reproductive parameter of one, where an average each person infects one, pa one new patient. And what you get is a very, very, very long plateau of new cases. What's well, not obvious from that graph, until you think about it, is that each of those new cases adds to a bubble of cumulative cases. And people with this disease tend to be sick, who are, who are sick, tend to be sick for something like 15 to 20 days. So what the health service has to cope with is not 400 people, which is bad enough, but it's 400 people times 20 days times the proportion of those who are sick. 
and it's getting those numbers out of these kinds of system is tricky because these are deterministic models. There's no room for chance in any of these models. Once you feed in the numbers, you get this result and you will always get this result. One of the things we know from decades of experience looking at epidemics, looking at infectious disease models, decades of experience which no policymaker is likely to have. Policymakers don't have that kind of background largely. They don't have a detailed technical background with substantial experience of dealing with problems on the ground. So they don't necessarily get that point. They don't understand what are the, they look at this picture and they think, well, it's going down, everything's fine, we're back to business by the end of May, for the sake of argument. In fact, the health service will not be back to business for at least a month after that, because it's picking up the pieces. These models are what happens if you release social distancing on the 5th of May. Now, I don't think anyone is seriously proposing to do that and the reproductive number changes. So the gray, the gray line is what happens if the reproductive number is 0.8 and stays at 0.8. These other numbers are what happens for various rises in the reproductive number. And as you can see, the number of cases rises sharply. It's sometimes hard to put these numbers in context. So a good way to think about it is that seasonal influenza, the, the winter flu we get every year, for which we vaccinate thousands and thousands of people every year, uh, which leads to several thousand deaths every year, the reproductive number for that is about 1.1 in the early stages of the outbreak. So even at very low reproductive numbers like this, you can have a substantial impact on the health service. You can have a substantial impact on the health of the population. And getting that across to policymakers is a serious challenge. How is it to be done? Well, different countries have come up with different ways of doing it. I'm going to stop sharing that for a moment. But the, a common element is that you send out for a collection of people who know something about whatever it is they're doing you get them to work together and give you the best advice they can. And this can go well, as it has largely gone in Ireland, or it can go incredibly wrong, as it has gone in the United Kingdom. One of our biggest problems as a country is that we share a land border with Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is not doing contact tracing. Contact tracing is the art of identifying people who've been in touch with infected patients and separating them from the general population. These infect, from the point of view of a virus, there is a person, there is a contact with another person, and in that contact, either the virus transmits or it doesn't transmit. If it fails to transmit enough, it dies out. So the virus's strategy is to transmit as much as it can. And this virus is fairly infectious. Left to its own devices, it's likely that each person would cause two or three other cases. There are viruses that are far more infectious. Measles, notoriously, is one of the most infectious viruses we know anything about. So this virus is not at all on the same scale as measles, which is good, but it is infectious. So we have to do something to manage new cases because whatever we do, there will be new cases. And what we're doing right now is we are identifying people who are sick, we are testing them. We are identifying their contacts if the test come back, comes back positive. This is not perfect because the tests take significant time to come back and it will be better to test faster and identify contacts faster, but we are limited by resources in doing that. But this contact tracing is central to disease control. So we've done a lot to bring the transmission of virus in our community down 
A lot of our cases now are occurring in nursing homes and amongst healthcare staff. I don't say that to induce complacency because those cases can and will uh, spark off an epidemic again if we relax our guard. We have to bring all pieces of this epidemic under control. But if we do, we do that by testing and contact tracing. And in, in the North of Ireland and in the United Kingdom, they have not been contact tracing. And they've not been contact tracing because they received advice from an anonymous group because no one knows who the members of that group are, whereas the members of Philip Nolan's group are well identified. Um, and their advice was wrong and not marginally wrong. It was very, very seriously wrong. And the United Kingdom, the people of the United Kingdom are now paying a very heavy price for that. In previous decades, the United Kingdom's followed a very similar strategy. They identify a group of experts. They get them together to, to produce a report on whatever it is. And there's a whole list of United Kingdom bodies on radiation, on air pollution, on water contamination, on heavy metals in soil, and uh, many, many other things which have been produced in the same way. And these reports are public and they are used as the basis for setting regulation and policy. The challenge we face in Ireland is capacity to do that. One of the reasons we tend to take stuff from the UK, besides the cultural similarities between our two countries, is they just have more bodies. They have more people with relevant skills and expertise. So we feed a lot of UK policy, a lot of UK basic science into our regulations here. And in fact, the UK has an outsized influence on European Union regulations as well. And obviously many of our regulations now are set in, in Brussels rather than, rather than in Dublin. And that would be one of the bigger losses. But that process can work very well, but it only works if you have a group of experts who are open, transparent and receptive. We don't know, as I said to you, who the British experts are. Their names have not been released. They have produced advice which is odd, would be the very least, I would say. And the UK is not alone in this. Uh, Sweden has done something similar. The Swedish advice is being provided by a single person, effectively, who has an idiosyncratic view of how to manage infectious diseases. And the Swedish population are probably paying a substantial price for the process their own government has used. So the challenge for a government is to set up systems that are open enough that you can get information in, but sufficiently closed that you can actually discuss policy without the discussion itself becoming the focus of the news rather than the policy. You can argue, and I would argue, that our government goes, as the British government does also, goes too far in the direction of secrecy about the construction of policy. But the processes are there, the processes are relatively open, and it's possible to bring in people who disagree. I had, so I had a certain amount to do when I was a PhD fellow with Comari, which was the Committee on Environmental Radiation. And there were people in that committee who disagreed quite strongly with each other. So there was a culture of constructive dissent in that group. There was no sense of groupthink. People would put forward an idea, they would be robustly challenged in that idea. And maybe their idea was right. Maybe it was wrong, but it was the better for being challenged. It was better put for being challenged. And the quality of advice going up the line to the minister was better as a result of that. 
And generally, if you have systems that allow for, in, for challenge and for serious discussion, you will get better quality decisions made. The other side to it is that it can be very difficult to identify whom to engage with in our system. And I'll turn now to talk not about the epidemiological modeling of coronavirus, which I've been engaged with, but separately from Alan's group, but to the other piece of work we're doing in coronavirus, which has kept me very busy, which is why I have no slides, which is a, a two large scale surveys of public opinion about the lockdown and how it is affecting people's lives. And we've asked people, what are, what are they doing for childcare? We've asked people, how has it affected their relationship? We've asked people the mood questions from Healthy Ireland. We've asked people, did they think that they understood the government's suggested changes in their behavior? And largely they did. And we've asked them, did they think they were adhering to those? And largely they also did, though they, they thought that other people were not being as compliant as they were. And that's a very common finding in social surveys. You think your own behavior is better than your neighbor's behavior. It's an almost inevitable human trait. We identified practical issues with regard to schooling, which perhaps contrary to our expectations, were more severe in primary school. And we've asked people how they would like to see the lockdown reduced. And something we did not predict was that um, the first priority for people in the lockdown was to be allowed to travel further than the two kilometers from their home. And something we did predict was that the last priority for people in lockdown was opening of pubs and restaurants. So there, there is a body of useful information there about how the Irish population are adapting to the lockdown. We haven't analyzed the mood data yet, so we can't tell you if it's better or worse or the same as it was last week. Or, but we, we, we will do that probably this afternoon. Um, so the question is, how does one bring this information to the relevant people in the government? And what we've found successful for other items is a combination of a private contact strategy and a media strategy. So what we try and do with anything we generate that we think might be of interest to the media is we send it to our best guess of the relevant person in the, in the relevant department. So they have a little bit of advance warning if they choose to use it. And then we present it uh, to the media. And that, the media, the politicians consume media voraciously. Politicians are really interested in news, really interested in news coverage. They, the kind of person who goes into politics tends to be someone who's interested in reportage. And that dual strategy seems to get to people. So you have the, the civil service know what the minister is talking about. And the uh, politicians are aware of it. And also you're providing a bit of background for the general public. So you're saying this is an issue, this is why we think it's an issue, and you can put your own perspective on whatever it is you've done. And you may find that your, your perspective is altered, perhaps quite considerably, uh, in the policymaking process. And that's fine because I, none of us are elected, none of us are accountable to the Irish public for making policy. But that dual strategy seems to work relatively well. The other piece that's very useful is long-term relationships. And being a, having engaged with politicians, with civil servants, with people in the health services over significant periods of time, you know them and they know you. And at the very least, they have some idea what to make of you. They, they may think you're the greatest fool on home, or they may have other views about you, but at least you're not a completely unknown quantity arriving at the doorstep clutching report. And that relationship allows you to understand something about where they're coming from and what their priorities are. 
and a significant priority for most people in political life in the civil service is timing. The people in the health service tend to be less concerned with the timing with which you bring them information and more concerned with doing something about it, which reflects the different time horizons amongst the two groups. But it is possible to carry out interesting scientific work to explain what is often very technical material to people who do not have a strong technical background, but it takes time to do it. So I'm being instructed to stop talking or I will be disposed of, but uh, I hope that has been helpful and given you some understanding of what I'm up to. Apologies, and for, Anthony, for, apologies for bringing you to a close, but I'm conscious we have two more speakers and we want to keep some time for discussions. But sincere thanks, very, very helpful insights, and we'll certainly come back Pleasure. to some of those concepts in, in the discussion. So next we have Maria, and Maria, can you share your screen with us? Yes, is that visible? Yes. Okay. You may want to put it on slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I can't hear you, Maria. Uh, shall I start? Yeah, work away. Like yeah. Oh, okay, right. So I'm uh, Maria Bagramian. I'm a professor of philosophy at University College Dublin, and I'm currently involved in a large scale project on uh, research on role of experts in policy decisions and uh, the, the element of trust involved in that. So what I'm going to present today is a part of that bigger project. I have a fairly long uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'll share with everyone and I've left uh, my email address for people to send their questions, comments, etc. because this is very much work in progress and as you'll see I'm constantly attempting to involve uh, various stakeholders, mainly the real flesh and blood people on the ground in what we are doing. So uh, my approach, unlike the approaches uh, today in this session, uh, or and in the other sessions is philosophical uh, rather than empirical, but it connects very well with what Anthony was saying. And I was very pleased to hear some of his comments. And I think that that's, that's the merit of uh, interdisciplinary work that we are attempting. We can work across various barriers when we have similar concerns and questions. So the two key components of a philosophical approach, at least the way I take them, is one, uh, to engage in conceptual analysis, to try and understand and critically examine key concepts we are using so for instance, today I will talk about the concept of evidence as uh, applies here to uh, the COVID-19 case and trustworthiness. And then to bring in normative considerations. So to examine the open spaces of reason that is uh, to ask about the right and wrongs of things and the good and bad. And that's obviously very relevant because this is what we are all trying to do to come up with the best uh, solution to the huge dilemma that we are facing. So uh, a bit of background. Uh, formal reliance on expert advice has become a feature of modern governance. Uh, in most advanced democratic countries, uh, there are formal uh, arrangements in place for seeking uh, expert advice and consulting with them. They vary quite a bit from different in, across different countries. UK, for instance, has its own scheme and the European Union has, has come up with its own uh, way of consult, uh, consulting with experts and they do vary quite a bit. Uh, but, but the aims are quite similar. So uh, to take a quick look at what the standard goals of uh, taking expert advice are. Uh, first is enlightenment, that is to be informed about the state of art uh, in various issues, uh, uh, problems that uh, policymakers are facing. Then to provide an orientation uh, to understand their challenge. 
then to help, help with strategic planning, providing strategies for reaching uh, some preconceived objectives. Problem solving may be the most important aim for that is formulating solutions to a given problem. And then a, a loftier aim, that of integration, that is bringing together various forms of knowledge and in the hope of co-creating knowledge across various experts and expert advice. All these goals are currently uh, still operative in the case of COVID-19, but uh, there is a radical change of context uh, in, in, in the current situation we are facing. That is, uh, COVID-19 has substantially changed the standard role of medical experts in policy decisions. Uh, and we are all witnessing this as a real life experiment. There is vocal reliance on experts by politicians referencing to their work all the time. Uh, no hesitation to bring them uh, with them uh, to uh, TV platforms and uh, indeed giving them such public visibility that they have become public figures. There are even dolls of American policy experts being produced and sold online. There is also the more important point of uh, the urgency and gravity of the task that, uh, pol uh, that advisors are facing now and facing it very publicly. So I have a great deal of sympathy for them and what they are doing. So uh, given this enormous challenge they're all facing, uh, there, there, there are a large number of difficulties and complexities that bear closer examination. I'm going to briefly discuss two uh, challenges and their normative consequences in this change context of policy expert advice. One is uh, the challenge of providing rigorous evidence-based advice and the emphasis here is rigorous evidence and then uh, the second the challenge of establishing trustworthiness in, in, in the face of these challenges. So on evidence, uh, there, as I mentioned earlier, there are standard procedures for seeking adv uh, expert advice. Uh, they are operative in various countries. And in particular for medical advice, there, there is this widely accepted hierarchy of evidence for medical uh, uh, practitioners. Uh, I, here on, on, on the PowerPoint, I have an example from the United States, but a very similar model applies to medical advice in the UK. Uh, and I, I expect Ireland is following the same pattern. Uh, so, so in this hierarchy of evidence, uh, evidence from randomized controlled trials together with, with well-conducted systemic review or meta-analysis of the results of these uh, trials are the gold standard of medical evidence. And then after that, we have uh, second tier well-designed controlled trials without randomization, well-designed cohort or case control of analytic studies, multiple time series with or without the intervention of uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic results from uncontrolled uh, experiments. And finally, opinions of respected authorities based on clinical experiences, descriptive studies, etc. So none of the items on this uh, hierarchy quite apply to the case of COVID-19. Um, for instance, randomized controlled trials, as I said, the gold standard of evidence gathering is simply not possible, or at least was not possible at the height of the pandemic. It may gradually become more feasible, but even when possible, it will take time to check and compare the results of such trials. Uh, and as we know, uh, the, the need for urgent policy decisions is, is paramount. Uh, and even the weaker criteria for reliable evidence gathering do not always apply to the case of COVID-19. For instance, it's difficult to get controlled evidence on different levels of quarantine and self-isolation. So, so what is being used, and it was mentioned this at Anthony's, uh, in, uh, during Anthony's talk, is modeling. So what, what are models? Uh, 
And models are indirect ways of exploring the world. You don't look at the world as such, uh, but you, you, you're constructing versions of the world and look at those ver versions. So models are necessarily artificial and uh, they are there for us to interrogate a segment of the world using what data we have available and also relying on, an, on, a, on certain assumptions about that data. So models are good as the data that goes into them, uh, as well as the background assumptions that will be uh, inevitable. And in the fast changing into information landscape of uh, COVID-19, data is, are inevitably incomplete and partial. Moreover, models reflect a localized segment of information as well as the researcher's theoretical biases. And I'm not using the term bias negatively here. It's just, it's just known that we bring in our theoretical assumptions in constructing uh, models. So, so, so such models may not be applicable to other locations, countries, etc. And that's what the Swedes, the Swedes say, for instance, you know, we are a high trust society, we can trust our people, whether right or wrong, we'll, we'll know that soon enough. And, and I think the evidence is showing that they are doing worse than their neighboring countries, but, but that, that's the sort of assumption they're bringing to their models. Uh, so uh, models are going to be inherently uncertain and error prone. However, they are currently the best tools that experts have in advising governments. Uh, so, so there isn't uh, anything much else that we can do in, uh, or at least policy uh, advisors can do in advising governments. So, so, but how are we going to deal with these uncertainties? I'm going to discuss three sides of the triangle of these uncertainties. Uh, Firstly, uh, on the expert side, uh, addressing what philosophers of science and science po policy uh, philosophers uh, call in the, the problem of inductive risk. So using models involve probability estimates. That, that's how models work. Uh, for instance, you look at the, uh, an estimate at uh, the effects of a certain policy on health services, on the number of life cells saved, impact on the economy, etc. So, so all you can do is to project based on estimates. Uh, reliance on probability estimates intr introduces what philosophers of science call inductive risks, i.e. the risks scientists incur if their probability estimates turn out to be wrong, uh, and also how wrong they are going to turn out to be. Um, I, I propose that following Heather Douglas, a, a prominent philosopher who works in this area, that uh, making appropriate value judgments are ways of mitigating such risks, the inductive risks. Uh, the rule of thumb here, and uh, that, that should be followed by everyone, is that the greater the risk of making an error, the less risk you should take regarding the welfare of those affected by the scientific advice. Uh, and that, that all sounds great, except that whose welfare are we talking about and what is the nature of the risk? And thirdly, who is to answer these questions? Uh, there are different groups affected by COVID-19 uh, pandemic. First and foremost, those who are in graver risk of death or serious illness, but, but, but also those who are affected by uh, the current lockdown. I was just uh, earlier today discussing and looking at the risk of the younger population, and the huge increase in phone calls to uh, child health lines. And that, that was eightfold increase actually just after school closed down. Uh, we know about the risk uh, to women and uh, other vulnerable groups uh, and, and who are facing uh, violence at home, etc. Uh, and, and then what are those risks? The risk of death uh, versus the risk of physical injury versus psychological risk 
That's, uh, these are all major questions, serious questions, but these are not questions that can or should be answered by uh, medical experts and by policy advisors or even policy makers. These are fundamental ethical issues. We should all have a role in answering them. So, so, so the way I think we should address the inductive risk is to do so collectively rather than leaving it to somebody who has medical expertise to answer the moral or uh, ethical uh, components of the question of inductive risk. So that was one uh, angle of the triangle I was discussing. And then on the public side, what are we going, what is it that we should be doing uh, in, in facing the uncertainty that is there in the evidence, regarding the evidence and the advice that scientists are uh, providing. Uh, I, think, I think the public needs to accept the fallibilistic approach of the sciences. Uh, the acceptance of fallibility, that is a willingness to self-correct, are some of the most admirable features of the methodologies of science. Uh, but their injection into science policy nexus has never been welcome. In fact, if you look at the way policymakers and the general public have treated scientific advisors, is exactly opposite the way science works. They expect certainty, they expect reassurance, they are uncomfortable with expressions of skepticism and, and uncertainty that's in there, in there to science. Uh, science, we know, can only offer the best explanation or projection based on data available and methodologies that we have, we currently have. Uh, it cannot do any better than that. And on the public side and on the politician side, we have to be willing to accept such, in, such fallibility. Third uh, angle of this triangle is the risk facing the experts. And I think uh, we, we are seeing this happening in Britain uh, already. Uh, Politicians, as I mentioned, rely on expert scientific advice to an extent that is quite unprecedented. And this currently is the right approach. But uh, they also, this also runs the possibility and risk of blaming the experts for policy failure. And uh, I would like to learn a bit more about this, but my suspicion has been that in Britain, uh, this has been happening for a while, as the experts that are being blamed uh, on policy decisions, rather than looking at the political reasons why certain experts were chosen or some experts rather than others were listened to. Uh, so I, I don't think Ireland is the is necessarily immune to this. We haven't had that experience here yet, but we shouldn't assume that we are, we are going to treat uh, experts uh, not, or not, uh, we are not going to scapegoat experts if things go really pear-shaped. So vigilance against transference of blame is quite important, I think. Uh, and, and if we didn't do so, the experts may become over cautious, in fact, in the uh, advice they are offering and, and just try to protect themselves rather than the public. And that would be a natural reaction. Uh, it is important to remember in this instance, as well as in other cases of expert policy advice, that scientists give advice on policy, but they do not make or implement policy. However, on the other side of the scale, politicians currently are also facing complex, unprecedented choices. Uh, so maybe it's time for politicians to become more like scientists, i.e. admitting deep fallibility and showing a willingness to continuously self-correct. Uh, but that option itself is somewhat risky in that we expect certainty of them from politicians, even more so than we expect it from scientists. The, the, as the general public can be quite unforgiving about 
politicians changing their minds. Uh, we remember uh, in America the sort of campaign that Kerry uh, faced, you know, flip flopping about flip flop being well it, it should be quite clear that that if you are making uh, if you have made a mistake in your judgment you should be uh, allowed permitted and forgiven for changing your mind so, so again the third side of the angle comes in we do need to be as as a public understanding of the under uncertainties involved and uh, be forgiving of both the scientists making errors uh, and also the politicians embracing their errors and admitting to them. So that's uh, on, on, on the side of uh, evidence. The second point I would like to discuss is trustworthiness, but could you please tell me how much time I have? Um, about another two or three minutes would be great, Maria. Okay, I'll just go through this very quickly there uh, and, and then my PowerPoint will be available online. So uh, it's widely accepted and argued and rightly so that trust in expert advice is necessary for the effective implementation of public policy. This is trust by policymakers as well as trust by the general public. And there are well-known uh, trust uh, markers for trustworthiness of experts. Uh, I have collated some uh, from, from mainly in philosophical literature, but you can find similar results uh, in, in uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I need to go back. Uh, excuse me for this. I will continue while uh, I try to make this come back. Uh, okay. Are you okay, Maria? Yeah. Uh, can you still see the sc screen? No. All right. Okay, I had a bit of a failure here. Okay, we can see it now. Yeah. Good. So, uh, the markers for standard markers for trustworthiness are competence, credibility, integrity and honesty, a track record and benevolence, that is having goodwill towards people who, from whom you expect trust. Uh, so competence is defined in terms of experts knowing what they are doing and having great many belie true beliefs. Credibility is to have uh, uh, the ability to provide correct information and employ rigorous methods. Integrity and honesty uh, is defined in terms of no not knowingly misleading the interlocutors. Track record is, of course, uh, uh, formal degrees, etc., but also comp showing competence in the area uh, of research and then benevolence is uh, to, to show goodwill and uh, not to take uh, risk with those whom you are advising. So, again, like as in the case of evidence, it seems that uh, the, these criteria, these markers for uh, trustworthiness are not fully applicable to the case of COVID-19. Uh, for instance, competence, it seems that no one has full competence in dealing with the novel coronavirus. At best, we uh, experts have a track record of dealing with other pandemics. Credibility, the same thing, what counts as credible evidence, as we saw in the first part of my discussion, is not fully established. Judgments of integrity and honesty on the other hand would largely depend on past performances of the experts but here comes something that that is part of what I am 
trying to push for in this discussion. The admission of fallibility, for instance, could be a criterion of honesty when the experts are facing the public, and not to hide uh, behind uh, a facade of knowing it uh, fully, even if that may seem to be more reassuring to the public. I think in the long run, it's better to be honest about the fallibility that's there in science and benevolence. Uh, once again, the question is benevolence towards whom? Uh, is it the vulnerable population and their families, the population at large, uh, those who are particularly vulnerable to the economic consequences of social uh, isolation, etc., cetera, et cetera. So the standard criteria, standard markers for trustworthiness do not fully apply to the case of uh, COVID-19. So, so there are mitigating steps that we can take in the face of this changed context. Uh, transparency and openness to scrutiny by other experts will minimize both the risk of error and improve credibility. So put all the data out there, make it open to everyone to scrutinize. Ireland, again, is good about this. Britain has been terrible about this, really, really terrible. Uh, but, but hopefully we will uh, continue the way we are. I'm going to finish in one second. Make the normative assumptions and value judgments explicit, because these normative assumptions are there, the value judgments are there, but, and, and they become markers for integrity. Three, involve more voices in the discussion about the choices and the value judgment. And in that, uh, it's the role of public to become involved in such discussions. And finally, respect the public as a mark of goodwill. They do deserve respect. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, very interesting ideas there, and I'm sure we'll come back to them in the discussion. Um, if you'll stop sharing your screen so that um, Alan can share his. Yeah, and I get out of this. I think if you go it's into okay, Alan can take stuff. over this. Okay, screen. Alan, can you take over there? Yeah, I'll do that now. Okay. Okay, uh, so let me kick off and uh, firstly thanks to the, the organisers for the invitation and uh, it's uh, lovely to be talking to people. I was looking in the, um, the list of attendees or whatever like that so I saw, I saw some familiar names and some friends there so it's nice, uh, nice to be connecting. Okay, so uh, let me sort of accelerate a little bit so that we have some time for questions. And I suppose what I'm really going to try and focus on uh, is the notion of the sort of the interface between the, the policymaker uh, on the one hand and then researchers on the, uh, the other. And uh, one of the themes I, I want to try and get a handle on, and this is going to be sort of, you know, possibly the big theme uh, of this talk, is that at one level, um, you know, evidence-informed uh, policy, uh, you know, it's a bit motherhood and apple pie-ish. Uh, it's something that, of course, we're all uh, in, in favor of. Uh, but sometimes it reminds me a little bit about interdisciplinary research. This is something that, you know, again, everybody is in favor of. Uh, but it can actually be a little bit more difficult to implement than people realize uh, because there are cultural uh, differences between the, uh, the two groups. And I think obviously, at a, you know, generally in, in life, we want to make sure uh, that, you know, policymakers are interacting with researchers in such a way that the best ideas are being brought to bear on policy design. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's important to be sort of aware and open to the sort of difficulties, cultural clashes that exist, because I think we're more aware of that, uh, we're more likely to solve these sort of difficulties at the outset and uh, bring about really what, what we need to see. Uh, in a lot of what I'm talking about, I'll be drawing very heavily on the work of two of my colleagues, Pete Lawn and uh, Dorothy Watson, so I just want to make sure I give them due uh, recognition at this point. Uh, and having talked about some of the, the generalities of these themes, I'll, do, I'll talk uh, then about uh, COVID uh, in particular. And again, just to be clear, what we're driving for here is, you know, the, the, the strongest and most productive collaboration uh, between researchers and, and policymakers, so we get the, the maximum social benefit at, at this time of crisis. 
So some uh, quick scene setting points, uh, as I describe them here. The first thing is, although I'm uh, the director of the, the SRI, which is E for economic and, and S for social, I am an economist by training. So there's a, a, a likelihood that the focus, like firstly, I'm really talking when I talk about uh, expertise and research is I'm really focusing on social science. Uh, and then within that, given my sort of um, training and perspective, I'd probably be saying a little bit more uh, about economics than anything else. I'm going to be talking about researchers on the one hand and policymakers on the other. And I don't want to sort of suggest any primacy of one over the other or any sort of greater moral authority or intellectual authority or anything like that of, of one of the, the, the other. Uh, in my experience in Ireland, we're very lucky. We have a wonderful community of researchers and we have actually a very good community of policymakers policymakers, where I'm including you know, both politicians and uh, civil servants and other public servants. I think we are very, very fortunate in Ireland to have the calibre of people that we do. So uh, I'm not sort of pitching one against the other or, or, or anything like that. Uh, and again, you know, core motivation and everything I'm talking about is to make sure that we get a, an interaction between the policymakers and the, uh, the researchers that's as positive as possible. Okay, and, and again, this isn't quite scene setting, but uh, I think some of these issues, the, the sort of first things I want to talk about uh, are, are, are things that have been said already and are worth talking about. Uh, the first is that, you know, sometimes there's a, an, an accusation made in, in Ireland that the, that the policy community is um, in some sense removed um, from the, the, the research community. But I think what's been remarkable so far in Ireland is the extent to which scientific advice has actually been um, generating the policy uh, decisions. An, an incredible uh, deference, I think, has, has been given, and I think that's been very, very positive. Um, in the same way that, uh, you know, all the early moves were really based on the, the public health uh, scientists, if I can call them that, it looks like any movement in terms of restrictions will also be heavily uh, dependent on science, and that's a, a very positive uh, idea. Uh, Anthony earlier on made reference to the Irish Epidemiology Modelling Advisory Group, uh, of which I'm a member. This is probably better known as the, uh, the Philip Nolan uh, committee. But for me, this is one of the most sort of positive examples I've seen in many, many years of a, a group of researchers who reacted very, very quickly um, to demands from the policymakers. And so this group was literally set up about five or six weeks ago when the policymakers realized they had a problem got the group of people together and asked them to start doing the sort of research that was needed to, de to develop the uh, EBI curves that have now become familiar and to really just sort of develop uh, the evidence base. Uh, it was remarkable to see a group of people coming together as quickly as they did, functioning as well as they have, uh, and that advice being taken and to pick up some of the, the points that Maria is making, make, I think in terms of sort of trust and rapid response and everything like that, this is a group that have, uh, have worked really, really well. Final point I just want to make um, before I move on to my next slide. One of the differences between this crisis and the last crisis is the, the, the government does now have the Irish Government Economic and Evaluation Service. Uh, and the reason I want to mention that is if you go back sort of long enough, the, the, the sort of two communities I'm talking about, as in the policymakers on one hand and the researchers on the other, it was almost like they were two completely distinct communities. And while they can have conversations, sometimes, um, you know, one of the models to do this is that you have a group of analysts stroke researchers actually in the, the, the policy sphere. Um, so you go back 10 or 15 years, there was an awful lot less of that. Through the creation of the government's economic evaluation service, you do have about sort of 100 to 150 economists and other social scientists and analysts uh, who, in a sense, are in the policy making system, uh, but have trainings and mindsets that are sort of research oriented. Uh, and that they very often can provide a sort of a, a, a bridging uh, function, which I think is really, really important. So again, the, it's not like the two worlds are sealed uh, apart, as we sometimes might think about it. Okay, uh, as I sort of flagged earlier on, one of my, my themes and you know, is this issue of possible culture conflicts or whatever like that between uh, researchers and policymakers and the desire that we work some of these things out. So what I'm gonna do, and again, I'm gonna blame uh, some of my ESRI colleagues, the, uh, Dorothy and Pete that I mentioned earlier on. So I'm gonna give you like a really horribly exaggerated characterization of policymakers' views uh, of researchers, and then I'm gonna do the, the flip side in the, with the next chart. Um, so it's a bit of a characterization, but as for all, it's a bit like stereotypes. There's always a small element of truth. So when you talk to policymakers, some of, some of the things that they, they just you know, have trouble dealing with uh, from the research is that they would see us, for example, as being too abstract. 
Uh, too slow is something that comes up all the time in the sense that they often have an immediate policy issue and you ask a researcher and they go away and they want to think about it and, 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 and do their, the, the work at the base that they do. Now, again, some of these accusations, of course, are, are totally unfair, uh, but, but these are the sort of uh, perceptions that we're uh, talking about. Uh, ignorant of political realities. I mean, again, I think this is sometimes where policymakers will see very sort of well thought out uh, policy ideas, uh, but they may fall on the hurdle uh, about whether or not they're, they're politically realistic. Uh, little understanding of how institutions work, and you hear that all the time. And then a very important um, point at the end there. You know, very often policymakers of the view the researchers more concerned with publishing papers than helping to develop policy. Now, I'll come back to that later on because that's one of the things where it, it it may not be the fault of researchers themselves, but it may be a fault of the institutions in which they work and what sort of prioritized and, and, and what's considered important. Now, let's do the flip side exercise. Let's look at the researchers' views of policymakers. Okay, uh, a lack of appreciation for the analytical rigor which is applied in social science research. Okay, so um, maybe all social scientists sort of suffer, you know, or whatever, feel a, a bit of envy uh, when it becomes to um, the harder sciences, if I can put it like that. Um, I think social scientists often feel, um, you know, that, that quite as the the bullet point says there, you know, researchers don't really understand the extent of, of uh, be it um, data analytics or qualitative analytics or whatever like that, 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 that sometimes these things can be dismissed. Um, we often to the researchers can, can have this sort of sense that, well, there's too many generalists and not enough specialists. I mean, this is a sort of a characteristic of the Irish Civil Service that most of the folks who work there are generalists. Uh, as opposed to specialists. And of course, in the research and the academic community, uh, you have exactly the polar opposite. And so we tend to appreciate the generalist view a little bit more. Uh, you know, so again, sometimes researchers will have the view that um, these policymakers are over concerned with managing politics. Okay, that the best idea is sometimes dismissed because the question arises, well, could politically, could we get this true? Uh, and also a sort of a sense on occasions that, that the policymakers, they're really just too focused on what I've labeled their silver, silver bullets are, are, are easy wins. Okay, it's, it's, it's not really sort of, you know, grappling with the totality of an issue or whatever like that, but just, just uh, get, get, get me the one policy measure that, that's going to work. Let me summarize that in incredibly uh, succinct, ridiculously succinct is the, uh, the phrase I've used on the bullet uh, point. But, but for researchers, to a certain extent, the motivation of the, of the work is to understand. And for policymakers, the, the motivation is to, to fix. OK, now, again, if I can sort of, you know, if I I'd, I'd drawn a Venn diagram of what this talk is about, is if you can imagine the policymakers have their circle on the one hand, the researchers have their circle on the other. There is an intersection between those uh, two circles, those sort of Venn diagrams. Uh, and really then, you know, the, the secret is, can, can we make sure that the, uh, the intersection is, is done as well as possibly, that we possibly can? OK, so what COVID questions, turning to the, the COVID dimensions then of the, the, the talk, what COVID questions would researchers tend to investigate? Okay, and I can tell this already from sort of some of the discussions I've had with, with, with colleagues both in the Institute and beyond that fundamentally social sciences will often want to look at the impact okay, of the crisis. And we started discussing some of these impacts already. We know, for example, there's impacts on terms of incomes, unemployment, uh, the issue of educational inequalities is coming up now all the time. The sense that you've got one group of kids who are sort of digitally connected with parents, of course, who can assist them in this sort of digital age and, you know, work, work it through homeschooling. Uh, and there's going to be a whole group of other kids who are simply going to be left behind uh, with all this. And the longer this goes on, the more difficult this is, is going to be. Health inequalities, yet a, an, another issue. Uh, if you live in sort of more crowded housing circumstances, um, you know, without a garden or whatever like that, um, in, a, in a more de de depressed area so that your two kilometer um, area is, is less appealing. You know, again, all sorts of things are going to be happening and they're going to be happening in all sorts of differential ways. So social scientists, okay, they're going to, going to want to know the scale of, of these effects and also the distribution of these effects, okay, including everything from socioeconomic group to gender differentials and a whole range of other things. 
And then typically we're also very, very fixated uh, with the channels um, of influence. So say if you take the health effects, is it a direct health effect or is it mediated in some shape or form through unemployment and income and all these sort of things? So that tends to be the primary interest to what the social scientist is, is looking at. There will absolutely be policy implications and most good researchers will distill the policy implications, but very often it can be a sort of a, a secondary or you know, the last paragraph in the paper. But by comparison, what do the policymakers want to know? Well, if I follow those sort of raw themes that I, I, I uh, distill there, policymakers will want to know what are the best policies uh, to combat uh, the sort of issues that we've just talking about. So if you take income supports, they're going to want to know what is the best way of doing it, whereby you can target income uh, at those who need it most. In terms of unemployment, they won't want to just know that unemployment has gone up or who's going to suffer more. They want to know what are the active labour market policies that we can do something about this. And likewise, on educational uh, inequalities or health inequalities, they are going to know what is it we need to do uh, to counteract the sort of issues that have, have come up? Um, and uh, they, they won't want to wait around for an awfully long time to do these sort of analysis. Okay, all of the policymakers and they're busy working at this already know uh, that the, the difficulties are there, and so they want to know very, very quickly what is it that we're going to actually do about this. And I should say, very often policymakers are interested in the distributional impacts uh, of the bad things that might happen. But very often, they're not interested as an end in itself. They're interested because they want to target uh, interventions. And again, this comes up in the context is that if you have a, a limited uh, set of resources to actually intervene, they want to make sure that their interventions are going to be as targeted as, as, uh, as, as possible. Let's talk again and just another few thoughts on, on the impacts that researchers are going to be interested in. Okay, I've talked about the sort of the, the household level impacts or on the, on the individual. There's also macroeconomic impacts on things like uh, gross domestic product. The public finance is obviously going to be uh, seriously impacted here. And then a whole set of uh, cash price and here is monetary variables, uh, everything from sort of debt dynamics, inflation, and a whole range of other things. Uh, another thing that social sciences are going to be interested in are the behavioural responses uh, on the part of individuals. Anthony mentioned some of these issues earlier on. I think one of the great things we're wondering about is when the restrictions start lifting, uh, to what extent will people be sort of fearful about doing some of the things that they previously were, were, were doing because there's a sense that the, the virus is still going to be uh, there. And then, there, you know, could be other things are, are, are some of the sort of things that we're doing, such as having uh, conferences uh, over the internet and stuff like that, are those sort of things that, that will uh, persist. Social sciences then more broadly are, are, are going to be interested in uh, even sort of, you know, uh, maybe less tangible uh, impacts, changes in political culture. Okay, Is it the case that because the state interventions have just been so much more extensive, uh, is that now something that's going to become embedded? Likewise, the things around social organisation, uh, working from home is going to be an example uh, of this. Um, institutions will have been impacted, uh, and if that is something else we're going to be studying, and then international relations, everything from the sort of, let's call it a new crisis in the European Union and how the European Union is going to deal with this uh, to attitudes towards China, again, in, in the context of, of the, uh, this difficulty. And uh, anytime I'm giving a talk now at all, uh, I always want to make sure the word climate uh, appears because there's no doubt there's, a, there's a, an ongoing backdrop there that we simply can't forget about. So those are all the researchers kind of notes, but what again about the policymakers? Well, again, on the macroeconomic uh, issues, of course, they're going to be interested. Curiously, this is one of the areas where they would see themselves as having a substantial amount of internal expertise. And so sometimes there might be less uh, likely to engage. So this is expertise, say, within the Department of Finance, within the Central Bank of Ireland, within the National Treasury Management Agency. Um, so you, you can make the case, actually, that, that there may be more expertise uh, there. And, and as a result, certainly engagement, but maybe not as, as tight an engagement between the policymakers and the researchers. Uh, behavioural science is something that's really uh, caught on, uh, as, as far as I can see, in public policy circles. Uh, they're terribly interested both in, in the sort of the thought process of behavioural science and also the, the methods that are, are, are being used there. And I think that is probably something that, that is going to accelerate. And on questions, things like sort of political culture and social organisation, I often think uh, policymakers, again, civil service and, and the politicians, they're very, very interested in these sort of things. 
but it's more from an observer uh, capacity. They want to know how these things are unfolding. They don't necessarily some of the, see some of these things as you know part of the policy levers that they're going to be pulling, you know, compared to say income supports and all these other things. So they're keeping a, a, an eye on these sort of things. They're interested, uh, but it's it's at a slightly uh, more removed. Okay, just about two or three more slides, which I'll go through uh, quickly. So what, what do we need to know? And uh, now, what are the sort of things that researchers need to uh, be, be thinking about and, and sort of concentrating on? Um, well, in, in all truth, I think we all know this, we need to know how to manage the pandemic uh, in the coming weeks and months. And that includes uh, the very, very tricky question uh, of when to release the restrictions. Um, and again, I think both Marie and Anthony have, have, have touched on this. Um, researchers at this stage can really only sort of contribute existing uh, information or they conduct uh, very rapid research. And to a certain extent, some of what's required of us now it takes us out of our comfort zone. Because uh, if you go back to that accusation, remember my characterization earlier on that we're too slow uh, at these sort of things. Uh, well, certainly for an awfully long time it, it, in my life uh, as a researcher, there was a sort of a concern about web-based surveys, you know, where, where, where it could not be representative and as a result, uh, you know, we weren't going to be sure about them. Uh, refereeing processes, I mean, certainly in economics, I know in other social science, I mean, the days of having to wait a year for your referees report, um, I think we, we've all been there, but those are just sort of things that I think are, are, are no longer acceptable and we need to keep moving. At the next stage of this, we need to, to, to assess what the damage is and then we're going to get into the business of designing what are the policies that can, can uh, cushion people from the worst effects. And again, here speed is going to matter. Uh, we'll have a certain amount of time to, to reflect on a research community, but we are going to have to really get, get in there and start helping to uh, design and assist in the design of policies, and we may have to do it on the basis of uh, existing in, in information. Uh, and when it comes to rebuilding, I think the, the, the questions we have to, again, start addressing, one is, are we just sort of simply going to rebuild what was there? Uh, or a, obviously a trickier question, are we going to start trying to rebuild uh, and create something that's new? And these are some of the issues that have now come on screen, such as the single uh, to your health system, is basic income essentially being, in a way, trialed already uh, through the, the COVID payments. Um, so again, that's, that's a new context for them. Okay, last slide. Lots of goodwill shown by the research community in the crisis and a willingness to reorientate research agendas. I think, again, if you look across both in Ireland and internationally, this sort of incredibly quick mushrooming uh, of thought on COVID, uh, I think, has shown that the, the research community uh, has been eager to engage in this. And then if you look at the policy community, I think there is a drawing and an, in, uh, an engagement with the research uh, that, that is in parallel. So this is, all, this is all good stuff. Okay, but can we maintain this? Okay, it's a bit like the, the sort of uh, adherence to the restrictions. Can we, can, can we maintain the good behaviour that, that seems to have broken out? So let me just put down a few challenges uh, for academia. So the first is, and I touched on this uh, earlier, so at an institutional level, can we place more emphasis on policy impact? Uh, and by, by that I mean in comparison, for example, to journal uh, impact, okay, in, in assessing um, how, how we evaluate people's work. Uh, can we communicate the policy impacts of our work more effectively? And I think, again, Maria touched on a number of those points. And the very last point I'll make, which is ter a terribly tricky one, can we ensure that our policy statements are fully evidence-based, avoiding opinion creep? And by that, I mean that sometimes I think uh, policymakers has a suspicion that somebody with the title of doctor or professor comes on to talk about the, 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 the policy relevance of their work, uh, but lurking somewhere in the background is the sort of the uh, ideological baggage or whatever like that of, of the individual. So I do think as, as people from the research community, and if we're given in a sense airtime or airspace to talk, there really is an onus on us to base what we're saying on, on, on the science of what we do and to try and curtail our uh, tendency towards, um, you know, our, bringing our ideological baggage uh, to discussion. That's a very difficult thing to do, to be perfectly honest, and I'm sure I've been guilty on occasions of, uh, of not getting that right. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's something that we need to keep an eye on. So I'll leave it with that. So back to you, uh, Anita. 
Thank you very much, Alan. Um, and I have to say, I want to thank all three of the speakers because what we've had are three very different contributions, each one of them extremely thought-provoking. Um, and I'm sure we, we, could, we could discuss it for, for hours. But I would like to ask each one of you a question before we get into the details. Are we looking at a fundamental difference in terms of the understanding among policymakers and in the general public of the importance of experts? You know, do you think that this experience you know, at the moment, most of the general public can draw the shapes of the curves. They're aware the government are listening to experts. Are we looking at a fundamental change in which how that in how that will play out in the future, or is this simply a blip and you know it will be forgotten very quickly? I'd be interested in your thoughts. Alan, do you want to come in on that? Uh, I, I can do. Um, the, the truth is, I, I, I actually I don't really know the answer, and I think we're going to have to wait uh, and, and see how, how, how this spins out. But if, if, if I could wait, make one point, and I think people may have heard this before, um, the, the, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council has existed uh, since the crisis, and I was one of the, uh, the earlier members uh, of it, one of the original members, and John McHale from Galway was the chair at the time. Uh, but I think it was Seamus Coffey, who was the more recent chair of the Fiscal Council, was asked recently, uh, was he slightly envious that the chief medical officer uh, seemed to have been given the keys to the kingdom, yeah. in the sense that whatever the chief medical officer uh, said went, whereas apparently the chair of the Fiscal Advisory Council uh, didn't have uh, quite the same uh, clout. So I, I do think it, it's interesting. I think when a, a technical sort of issue arises, and by technical now I, I mean uh, the sort of the management of the pandemic, uh, I do think folks in the, let's call it the natural sciences, uh, possibly because, and this is back to some of Maria's point, there is a perception that there is a, a level of, of rigor and certainty around what they say that is a little bit different from what the social scientists say. Uh, and so I think a lot of the positivity around the expert advice it, it relates to the fact that we're seeing more hard science oriented people on our television screens as opposed to the usual talking head group. Um, so where, where that all will meander in time, I don't really know. Okay. Maria, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, if I, I think if you were to leave this to the, just the hope that the public will remember the crisis and there will be a change in the role of experts, etc. That, that hope is unfounded. Looking back at other occasions when uh, our society and others have faced a crisis uh, and, and what has followed from that, the answer is very little in terms of fundamental changes. But I also, maybe somewhat cynically or optimistically, depending on your slant, I, I believe that we should never uh, let a crisis go to waste. And this is the time to actually introduce procedures uh, and, and, and think about the role of experts in a very public way and make sure that there are parameters about their involvement, their due importance is given to them, to their scientific advice. And by science, I mean both social sciences and, and uh, hard or natural sciences. So this is the time to, to introduce some uh, parameters and, and profound thinking about the role of experts rather than just to hope that the crisis will bring about a change willy-nilly or naturally. Yeah, I think that was what my question was edging towards. Anthony, do you want to comment on it? Yeah, I think, I think we have to push. Uh, on, on, I'm not as sanguine as Alan is about the proportion of generalists in our civil service. I think it's a serious problem. I think a good deal of what many departments do is outsourced to um, mainly to the multinational consulting companies, in fact. And they, they are doing work that should be core civil service work. And this is leaving really leaving a hole in the system. I think it makes sense to call in people who are very specialised and you have very specialised requirements. But you should have the capacity in your system built and baked into your system to actually do the work you need to do to run your department, be that the Department of Health, Department of Local Government, Department of Justice, or even the Department of Finance. And that's a, that remains a challenge for the, the services, and I think we need to push at that. 
Okay, so if we come back, um, Anthony, you, you might have seen there's a question has come in on terms of the reproduction number. People are really asking, is that a stable construct? Do all countries use the same standard to produce the number or would slight differences in the latency or the incubation period alter that number? And then a question as to whether we should have different numbers for different populations, you know, looking at the healthcare workers or different areas of the country. Billion dollar questions, Anthony. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm worth that much, but um, okay. It, it, what the number is, it's a description that comes out of a model. Mm. And the way it has a simple physical interpretation, which is, it is the number of cases on average caused by one case. It changes between situations. If you go to the wilds of northern Canada, where your nearest neighbour is 100 kilometres away. It doesn't matter how infectious what you've got is, they're not going to get it. So it doesn't tell you everything you need to know about a virus, but it does tell you something about how the outbreak is going at the moment. And it changes. I think I said earlier that measles typically has a very high R0. And that's what happens if a population that's not exposed to measles is, a, is suddenly it is introduced. And very likely everyone in the population, not everyone, but 80%, 85% of the population will get measles. Smallpox is somewhat similar. Um, it's it highly, highly infectious. This virus is much less infectious. The R0 tells us that, but it's how the R0 changes over time is a measure of what our public health uh, activities are achieving. It's a measure of what the, the way in which people have changed their behaviours is doing. And yes, you, you could do it for different areas. And I'm fair, I haven't done it, but I, I suspect strongly that if I did it for Dublin, it would be higher than if I did it for Leitrim, simply because the population density in Dublin is higher than the population density in Leitrim. So I think, does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think that very much uh, addresses the issues. There's another question here, and I think Maria, perhaps this is mostly aimed uh, at your area, but the others might like to comment on it. Evidence-based policy seems to rest on an incoherent factor value distinction that empirical evidence can be neatly quarantined or siloed from normative value judgments and that experts can put aside their normative commitments when giving evidence. Do you have a view on this distinction between facts and value, Maria? You're muted, by the way. Do you want to unmute? So uh, anyone who knows my work might pr probably knows that I don't believe really in the fact value distinction. And, and a great deal of what I was so saying today is actually based on a rejection of that distinction. So I think I'm in sympathy with whoever asked the question on this point. Uh, when, uh, it's the science is value laden uh, and uh, we, we can discuss this at length. Uh, I, I, I do have arguments for it. But the important thing is not to try and make science value free, but to see where the values are coming from uh, and, and to try to understand them make sure that we have the value embedded in science that we want them to be there rather than allowing uh, values that are negative or detrimental to creep in uh, 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 and catch us by surprise. So yes, uh, I, I think it is quite important to make sure that it's well known that any expert advice, whether in natural sciences or social sciences that scientists give to policymakers will have a value component uh, because both on philosophical, from philosophical perspective and empirical perspective, value-free science just does not make much sense. Thank you very much, Bria. Alan, could I come back to you? I, I love your pragmatic analysis of the different perspectives, it, it, beautifully drawn, right? Could I ask you if there was one thing you could change, Alan, you know, if you had control to, to wave a magic wand and change something in the system at the moment, what would it be? Um, I think, and 
Anthony kind of touched on this as well. I mean, I, I, I made this sort of put the characterization about the number of generalists uh, in, in the civil service. But one of the, and it's probably true, there probably are too much, uh, too many generalists in, in the civil service. Uh, but one of the issues that they've, they've always had terrible trouble dealing with is providing career trajectories uh, for the specialists. Okay, so if anybody who's ever worked in the Irish Civil Service has sort of interacted with it, uh, what, what, what you work out very, very quickly is in order to sort of move up uh, the ranks, um, you almost by definition have to be a generalist. It's very difficult for specialists uh, to, to, to move up uh, the ranks. Uh, because there is a perception at a certain point that you need to have a sort of a broader perspective or whatever like that. So uh, this has been an issue that has been problematic for the Department of Finance for many, many years. Um, and a lot of sort of great economic minds that, that work there either moved out uh, or within it, they sort of moved on to do a whole range of, of, of different things. So I, I have you know, discussed this with civil service firm for a long time. If, if it was possible, uh, rather than just sort of saying, oh, we need more specialists, uh, I think that will only ever happen if there can be a greater career structure uh, for specialists within the civil service, which could include greater mobility uh, between the academic uh, environments and the, uh, the civil service environment as well. Because uh, again, I think if you look uh, internationally, it's not unusual that uh, researchers and senior academics would move into government departments for a period of time and vice versa. And that very often, uh, some of the culture clash that I was describing could be significantly reduced if you had that sort of mobility. So these are almost like uh, sort of human resource uh, policies to attack some of the issues that I was uh, I was mentioning. Thanks very much, Alan. Another question, um, Maria, that you've underlined that fallibility is central to science and that this isn't welcome in the research policy interaction. Is it possible that part of the reason for this is overclaiming by researchers, which the, the commentator says is more prevalent in the social sciences than the natural sciences? So maybe the issue is not as cultural as Alan mentions, but that the knowledge policy interface is really complex, that the, the issue is complex rather than culture. Cultural. Do you have a view on that, Maria? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so that that's a very good and complex question. I think the overclaiming can happen in both natural sciences and social sciences. It's not just just the social sciences, and that's because the dynamics of the expectations. Because, uh, for instance, in climate science, uh, it, it's give, given the sort of basic animosity shown by some governments towards climate scientists and uh, their results, there, there's a pressure to overstate your claim mm. in, in ways and hide any disagreements because mm. disagreements, we know there, there are case studies of these disagreements that are natural to uh, the, the both natural and social sciences that are part and parcel of the methodology of sciences. They are taken up as signs of the, the, uh, the, the unreliability of scientific uh, findings and then for something as serious as climate change and its impact for policy uh, uh, advice and policy decisions, uh, climate scientists some at times have been forced to overclaim things in ways that they wouldn't do when they when talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's, it, there is a whole area of discussion there that we need to unpack to avoid overclaiming both by natural scientists and social scientists. And yeah, we could migrate to an environment where overclaiming wasn't necessary. That would yeah. be the best outcome, yeah. yeah. There's a wonderful question here. I'm not sure if anyone's going to ask it, but do you think that the lockdown will be extended? Is it a risk? And a comment that the take up of remote working has been slow in the public administration. Somebody want to take that? <laughs> I'll, take, uh, I'll take part of it. Yeah, go on. Yes, uh, the, the lockdown at the minute runs to the 5th of May. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks it's going to stop on the 5th of May. Yeah. It may shift, it may modulate, but it's not going to stop. That's been, uh, that's certainly my best prediction. Remote working, I think we really need to, to push certain employers, and I think you're probably right, the public sector is part of this, to very consciously say, well, if they're not letting people work at home, why not? Yeah. Justify it. And there are jobs you can't do at home, but many, many 
clerical, administrative, managerial uh, and academic jobs, you can do just as well from this kind of space. If you have it, obviously, which is a different question, but you can do just as well from this kind of space. And the, the arguments about security, which are tossed out, are seriously overblown. It is possible if you have a well, well designed network that is itself robust, it is possible to extend that network elsewhere with very high levels of security and people do it all the time. Yeah, I think many of us have been surprised at just how much can be done remotely. I think most of us have been pleasantly surprised. Alan, do you have views on that, the uptake of, of remote working in the public administration? Well, I, I mean, just uh, reflecting on the broader theme of the uh, session in terms of evidence, I, I don't know if the, uh, the question is still there, but I'm not sure what is the evidence uh, that remote working has been slow in public administration. It's an anonymous attendee, right? Somebody yeah. who didn't, uh, yeah. It's yeah. an interesting no, I mean, they, they, they may yeah. be right, but all I'm saying is I, I, I've no sense um, that, that it, it, it has been slow uh, compared to a range of other, uh, so I, I, I kind of don't necessarily want to comment on it uh, on that basis, but certainly in terms of the, the public service that I'm dealing with, uh, this would be, you know, a, a particular group or whatever like that, but uh, my understanding is that there's, uh, there's, there's plenty being done remotely by the public administration, so I just, I'm just not sure. Can, can, can I come in? Of course, here? Maria, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, well, I'm not sure if working at home is as easy for everyone, for instance, women uh, in particular who uh, still have main child caring duties, they, they do find it more difficult. Younger women, younger colleagues, men as well, I've had this, this, these discussions in our school and there is a difference between sort of, let's say, our age group and 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 and, and the, those who have family and caring duties. So I, I I don't think we should underestimate the the pressure that working at home puts on a substantial segment of our population if the children are also at home. Yeah, I think I think that's that's true. Um, another question here: Does the media have a responsibility in allowing true experts in a field to have a voice? So, for example, there's been much criticism of the public health policy of NFET by clinicians with little training or expertise in the field, and perhaps this isn't constructive or helpful in dealing with the public anxiety in relation to the virus. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alan, well, do you I, want to come in on that? I, yeah. Like, uh, it, it's probably a more general comment uh, rather than the specifics. Um, but I think it, it, it is one of the difficulties, I think, for media uh, is even the best, and you might like it's sort of the best shows in the sort of an intellectual sense uh, and, and that sort of sense of uh, providing public information, all of these shows love conflict. Um, and I think there is often a, a tendency, uh, sometimes the media are sort of accused of being part of, of, of the group think or being comfortable or whatever like that, but, but in my experience in the sort of things I have to say, uh, there can be a tendency to bring people on partly for expertise on occasions, but the media love somebody who will take a con contrarian view. Sometimes contrarian views are very, very good things, uh, but a contrarian view just for the sake of the contrarian view, I actually don't think really helps uh, the situation. And I have no sort of real sense as to how uh, the media or media outlets uh, monitor who comes on and, and how expertise uh, is kind of, you know, defined uh, in, in their role. So I think it's, 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 it's a broader issue and it, it's, it's possibly a, um, you know, a, a bigger problem than we might realise. Yeah. There's another question here as well, Alan, asking you, would you address the question about complexity being the main challenge rather than culture? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, can't, I, I, I can see who's asked it and uh, because the person asking it is a much deeper thinker than I am, uh, I'm going to have trouble uh, making something up uh, in, in, in response. But if I could try and link it back to the sort of questions about uh, fact and value, Okay, and stuff like that. I think we, I think we need to be very, very careful about this uh, because I do think facts exist, um, and you know, the the notion that in in a sense, of, you know, er, everything that gets said has a value dimension. I think that's probably true, but I think there is a spectrum here. Um, and for me, you know, the the, the real contribution and the important contributions. Um, and I'll, I'll talk primarily now about sort of qualitative social or quantitative social scientists. 
is that if, we, if you take the data and you analyze the data and you're very explicit in whatever assumptions that you're, you're, you're applying and you make sure that the data is sort of kicked around by colleagues in your interpretations, I think there is a very important contribution that is still there, uh, which is in a sense, I'm not saying it's totally value free, uh, but I, I do think facts that are presented through careful, rigorous analysis of good data uh, should have a different standing to a pure opinion. Um, and so, um, I mean, that, that's probably answering a slightly different point, but it, it, it is something that I did want to get, get, get in there. On, on the specifics about complexity versus culture, I, I do still think culture matters enormously. And uh, even if we sort of think about it at, at, at the moment, the natural inclination for a researcher to want an answer to their question today versus the researcher's desire to be deliberative. Um, you know, those two things don't sit easily together. And I suppose as my, my role as director of the SRI, I'll often find myself saying to researchers, look, on the basis of the 30, you know, 20 or 30 years of your experience looking at a particular issue, I think you have really important things to say. But as a, a researcher, there's always this uh, innate um, sort of tendency to want to do another research project or look at the data again or look at the latest paper that is, you know, there's an adherence, and I think it's part of our training. There's a caution, and which is a very good thing in, in research, but uh, for a policymaker, you just have to go and make the decision today with whatever information is available to you. So that, that's the sort of cultural conflict that I was kind of talking about. Maybe culture isn't quite the right word for it, uh, but, but, I, but I think those, those are, are, are some of the real issues. Thanks very much. I'm afraid we're way over time. So unfortunately, I think we could keep the conversation going for quite a long period of time, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw it to a close. I want to thank all three contributors. I think each one of you brought a very thought provoking and insightful perspective to the discussions here today. I also want to thank all of the people who participated in the questions and answers. And finally, I want to thank the people who made this event possible, particularly the Geary Institute at UCD and the Irish Research Council. I think at a time where it's difficult for us to get together and share ideas, exploiting the opportunities to do it in this way is really important. We need to continue to challenge ideas and to think about these issues um, in, in, a, in a deeper way. I have to see as a mere natural scientist, I've learned an awful lot in the last hour and a half. I've really enjoyed listening to all of you and I would like to thank everybody who is playing a role in informing our, the decision making at a national level I think we owe a great amount, a debt of gratitude to everybody who's contributing at all different levels the frontline medical staff but also the people who are contributing to the development of the modeling and advising the policymakers. I think it, it really is wonderful to see people coming together and keep up the, the good work everybody um, Mark do you want to say something before we finish out and uh, no no uh, just just thank everybody for taking part yeah. But before we finish, can I just yeah. thank Anita for chairing it so expertly and beating us into keeping more or less to time. So thank you. Yeah.